welcome to the second in Nine Bedford Rows International Criminal Law webinar series for 2021. Uh, this month's uh, title is called Evidence Challenges in International Criminal Law. The first of our webinar series dealt with the narrative. We're now looking at the challenges concerning evidence. And as I said, we're dealing with these uh, lectures in a way through the webinar program because of the sad cancellation of last year's conference programs for everybody. And it looks like unfortunately 2021's conference programs will meet with the same fate. So we decided that a webinar series was a good way of everybody keeping in touch and to develop some of the key issues in international criminal law over the year. Um, I'm very pleased tonight to have again another stellar cast. Um, I'll introduce them now. Sarita Ashraf from Garden Court Chambers. Uh, Sarita is a barrister. Uh, she has been a senior analyst on the investigative team for the UN in respect of Daesh or ISIS. Um, she has been an, a senior legal consultant with the international mechanism uh, for the Syrian Ab Arab Republic. Uh, and she has also worked on UN General Assembly Resolution 248 and, and has been a consultant to the Global Justice Sentence in New York, researching and writing on gender, genocide and obligations under international law. She's got a very extensive CV but she is someone who's at the very heart of investigative challenges in these modern cases that we have involving Iraq, Syria, uh, and elsewhere. Um, next up on tonight's list is Professor Alex Whiting. Um, I'm very glad to introduce him. He and I were IBA War Crimes Committee co-chairs for a number of years and organized those series of uh, conferences in the Hague together. And uh, Alex, I know, is uh, an international lawyer of fantastic experience. He's been uh, a prosecutor at the ICTY. He's been a prosecutor at the ICC. Uh, and he is now heavily involved in the Kosovo Tribunal, having prosecuted the first of the uh, cases involving Kosovo at the ICTY. A very distinguished academic from Harvard, and I think the international uh, legal world is very lucky to have someone who really understands this subject, working hands-on in, in prosecution teams uh, in relation to uh, serious legal issues that these cases uh, throw up. So. Welcome to you, uh, Alex, and you've joined us from The Hague. Next up is someone called Gillian Higgins. I've known her for many years. I see a number of you smiling now uh, because you know Jill and I go a long way back. Um, she started her legal career on the Musuma case with me at the Rwanda Tribunal, and then she went on to deal with the media uh, prosecution and was involved in that for several years. And once the Milosevic case started at the ICTY, um, I plucked her from there and brought her onto the team. And she ended up becoming co-counsel with me for the last two years of the defense case uh, of Milosevic's trial. Uh, and then we went on to deal with the Chermak case uh, and then the Kenyatta case at the ICC and Jill has been involved in a number of leading international criminal law projects and great to see her again this evening as one cannot meet up in chambers or the office uh, these days. So there we are. I'm going to address my first speaker first of all and it's you Sarita and the topic that you're opening for five minutes concerns the difference between sounding the alarm and collecting evidence, a case study on the Yazidis, and you've been deeply involved in the Yazidis issue, uh, as I know. Sarita. 
Thank you, Stephen, and uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm very pleased to speak about the Yazidis as a case study in the challenges um, of between collecting evidence after the relative ease of sounding the alarm. As I hope most of those attending will know, um, in the early hours of the 3rd of August 2014, um, ISIL attacked the Sinjar region of northern Iraq, which is the home to uh, the Yazidi religious minority group. Globally, they number about 1 million people, but the majority of those, approximately 400,000, lived in Sinjar at the time. Um, ISIS reviles the Yazidis publicly as polytheists and idol worshippers and drawing upon misconceptions long present in Iraq and other Middle Eastern societies uh, as devil worshippers, none of which are, are, are accurate. Um, within initial days of the attack, reports emerged of ISIL committing almost unimaginable atrocities against the Yazidi community of men, older boys and women past childbearing ages being uh, executed of younger women and girls, some scarcely older than nine, being sold at slave markets, beaten, forced to labor, and held in sexual slavery, and of young Yazidi boys being taken um, from their okay. mother, uh, indoctrinated, forced into ISIL training camps, and, and forced to fight. When it came to sounding the alarm, this was done with, with relative ease. Um, it started with the, uh, the images of the Yazidis fleeing onto Sinjar Mountain, uh, which is a central point within the Sinjar region, followed by US and Iraqi airstrikes. In the weeks and months that followed, a mass documentation campaign started by survivors groups, international and local uh, NGOs, government permissions, and the United Nations. Much of that relied upon um, the testimonies of female survivors. Our understanding of what happened to these EVs is primarily born out of um, the women who came forward to explain their experiences and what they not had experienced themselves, but also what they saw. Um, another reason why sound, that sound alarm became, it, it was uh, relatively straightforward was that the community was very supportive of the women speaking out. For those of you that have done investigations in the Middle East, you'll know that often trying to look at crimes um, can, that, that relate to um, sexual violence in particular, although of course the crimes against Yazidis went far beyond that, but to interview women and girls as um, the primary source of information has been very challenging. But in this challenging, but in this particular case, the Yazidi community embraced the women, they recognized it as a, not an attack on the women as individuals, and that allowed um, the sounding of the alarm and for female activists and female survivors to become really the face and voice of bringing uh, these EDs to the attention. Also helpful is the fact that ISIL has never sought to reframe what they were doing. They are quite unusual um, with that. I think the perpetrator groups is that they don't try to cloak what they're doing under, under the guise of war or um, of fighting between opposing forces. They had always been very clear as to what they thought of these EDs and felt that what they were doing was theologically um, mandated. And so that also helped in, in sounding the alarm. Uh, for sounding alarm, ISIL obviously encourages that. It's also a means of spreading terror through its videos, through its public statements, and so on. Um, the unabashed brutality of ISIS crimes against the Yazidis, and in particular in sexual enslavement of Yazidi women, women and girls, transfixed international media and amplified the attention that the Yazidi suffering received in the corridors of power of governments and in the United Nations. Consequently, the calls for justice and the meaning here of justice being very specifically directed towards criminal accountability were incredibly strong. They were coupled with a quite a belated attempt to manage expectations on the part of the Yazidi community about how long justice could take if it could ever be achieved. The collection of evidence occurred across the board with NGOs. Um, that was uh, generally focused on crime-based evidence. With the Security Council Resolution uh, 2379 in 2007, the creation of UNITAD, collection of evidence has, um, has leveled up significantly. Nevertheless, it is significantly more difficult than sounding the alarm, in particular as regards linkage information due to the lack of defectors from ISIS, the lack of access to insiders, and the high level of attrition, which is say deaths of people inside ISIS. Accessing ISIS internal documents rather than external documents meant to be read and consumed by other audiences has also been challenging, which also creates challenges around understanding the effective um, versus the de jure command structure. When it comes to collecting evidence, it's also extremely challenging at the moment because uh, everyone is collecting evidence without a clear idea of which court it will go towards and what the rules and procedures of the evidence are of the jurisdictions it is facing. 
So the, the, there are multiple collections of evidence aside from um, the more pragmatic collection of evidences uh, concerning uh, security uh, in Northern Iraq. Thank I'm very mindful of my five minutes. <laughs> ah, thank you, Sarita. You've thrown up a ton of issues uh, there. And as you were telling us about it, uh, a number of matters were, were going through my mind. We'll look at those in the discussion afterwards, how that um, uh, very difficult challenge is being dealt with uh, in terms of international criminal justice. Can I turn now to, to Alex? Alex, you're going to discuss briefly with us the use of intermediaries and lessons learned from the Lubanga case, which was at the ICC and the first prosecution uh, at that court. Yes, um, thank, thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, and thank you for your kind introduction. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, and it's a pleasure to appear with um, uh, uh, Sarita and Jillian. Uh, and I look forward to our discussion. Um, the intermediary topic is a great topic, I think, for this um, theme of evidence challenges in international law, because um, I think when, when you think about evidence in international law, what you have to think about is, is the particularities of international tribunals. What are special about them and what, are, what particular challenges to evidence collection do they pose and what particular risks in collecting that evidence? And both of those things I think are captured in the intermediary problem. What, what was the intermediary problem? Well, it, as Stephen, as you said, it arose quite dramatically in the first prosecution at the International Criminal Court in the Lubanga case. And what happened is that the, the prosecution used intermediaries to um, identify and uh, bring forward a number of uh, victim, child victim witnesses. Um, and the problem is what was uncovered in trial and um, became a major impediment to the prosecution was that um, it appeared that a number of those witnesses had been, had been coached or encouraged or tainted by the intermediaries. And this caused a disruption in the trial and ultimately caused the, the trial panel to disregard many of these witnesses. Um, the wrong lesson to draw from this experience is that intermediaries should not be used by the prosecution or by the defense or, or anybody else investigating. Um, in fact, intermediaries are essential in international criminal investigations. Why? Because um, they, over, they, they address a particular challenge in these investigations, which is that the tribunals are operating um, far, often far away from the, from the place of investigation. They have limited resources. They move slowly, so often other actors get there more quickly. There are serious uh, witness, uh, witness um, security issues that arise from deploying investigators from, from The Hague or from Geneva or from London to conflict areas. Um, and, and most importantly, uh, that follows from that is that these env the environments in which we're operating often are, are very closed um, to outsiders um, and, e and outside, outside investigators coming in would be easily identified. Um, and so for security reasons, you need to have a way to get into those communities um, to at least identify witnesses who can then be later interviewed and can serve and provide evidence to ca ongoing cases. But that also poses risks. So using intermediaries addresses challenges that in, in these investigations, but it also presents risks as was dramatically presented, uh, discovered in the Labanga case. Um, risks of taint of, uh, uh, of the witnesses and of the, of the integrity of the investigation, because essentially you're using outsiders um, to further your investigation. So how do you manage those risks? And that is really the lesson of the, of the Labanga case and the, the intermediary issue is learning how to manage the risks in using intermediaries. And the way you manage the risks, there's several, there are a number of steps that you have to take in, in 
using intermediaries. You have to select your intermediaries carefully. You have to train them. You have to provide clear guidance on what they can do and what they cannot do. What they can do should be very limited. They should be carefully monitored. You should use a diversity of intermediaries so you have no, the case doesn't depend on any one intermediary, but you have a multi, multiplicity of intermediaries. And finally, when you, find, when you identify the witnesses using intermediaries, you have to interview those witnesses carefully to ensure that they have not been tainted and that they're providing their evidence uh, independently and you take steps to corroborate that. Um, so intermediaries are an essential tool. Um, they overcome challenges. They have to be used carefully and, the ste and steps have to be taken to mitigate the risks. I use exactly five minutes. Thank you very much, Alex. And what you raise there as being the issues, it's really to ensure the independence of your investigation and that you remain in, in control of it and that it is genuinely uh, an investigation and not a case being put by one side uh, against another. And those are, are lessons learned by, by all of us. Uh, Gillian Higgins, substantiating the evidence now, and um, we've heard about alarms and uh, substantiating the evidence, I guess, is what you're going to address us upon now. I am. So let's get stuck in. Substantiating the evidence. What we're really talking about here, I think, is competent evidence. So it's establishing it by proof. And when we're talking about evidence, of course, we are looking at information that is in the trial in the sense that it is used to um, prove or disprove the alleged crimes. As lawyers, however, whether we're prosecutors or defence lawyers, we are concerned with authentication. We're concerned with chain of custody, to what extent the evidence is hearsay, and if so, whether those sources are identifiable. We're concerned with reliable, trustworthy information. And one of the big risks is that in our times, at this present moment, there is a potential flood of information that comes before a prosecutor. And the task is to sift and to cast your net, I think, widely enough to be able to develop a case theory, to identify crime base, to identify linkage, but also to sift out what I might call rotten fish or polluting rubble. So bits and pieces that if left in the process will actually start to distort the trial because what you get is uh, an allegation of what has happened. And if we are suffocated or the process is suffocated by too much information, which doesn't amount to evidence, then the, the, the gap between what allegedly happened and what can be substantiated on the other hand by viable evidence becomes too wide. And in particular, I think there are certain challenges, one of which I'm thinking of is a particular type of evidence which has come to challenge the ICC and that is of NGO reports, which typically are produced to present a historical uh, narrative of events or to influence the actions of policymakers. But we know that overuse of this information again can distort. In the case of Amber Shamana, the judges there refused to confirm charges because they were concerned about over reliance on this type of evidence. And similarly in Bagbo, the judges warned of relying on this type of evidence that is not, they described, the proper fruits of an investigation. We are also challenged when we are trying to substantiate evidence by, of course, confirmation bias. So again, we must be aware as lawyers of whether or not we are approaching a case with an open mind. And this incoming excessive amount of open source information, so from NGO reports, from media reports, different types of sources, governments, um, intermediaries, uh, states, individuals, again, can pose real challenges 
because that sift must take place. And on an international level, we are missing that police force. So we're missing a first sift, if you like. Uh, and without that first sift, for me, there is a new dimension to the prosecutor's obligation, of course, to ensure that in the information that becomes evidence, there has been proper regard to the disclosure to the defense of exculpatory material. So to, to make sure that the rights of the defense are protected in this potential flood scenario where distortion is a real, uh, real vi viable um, outcome, because of course the defense must always be entitled to unpick, dissect, uh, get to the bottom of the sources of the information that are being provided. So lots of considerations there to think about in terms of not just the sources, but how we ensure that the court process is not distorted. Right. Thank you very much, Jill. Now, Sarita, if I can turn to you first of all, because um, you're a barrister, so you're aware of the trial obligations, but you're dealing hands on and you're there with these very difficult cases that, that you're part of the investigation team. And I, I wonder, while you're collecting evidence, whether, whether you have an eye to how this fits into a case, or, and if so, against whom and uh, for what charges. I, I guess we'd like, like to know how you think it through. Yes, so the aim of the collecting of the information is to, to build cases um, and within UNITAD specifically here, uh, the, can I just divide the collection of information into kind of two groups really. One is the collection of information which is quite disparate and spread over a large number of largely um, CSOs, NGOs on the ground, usually both international and national, but now largely national. And for there, we do see much more challenges in collecting evidence because they're essentially collecting crime-based evidence, testimonies from people who suffered crimes and or witnessed crimes directly. And that is really a, a victim survivor focused collection of evidence, which is largely divorced from this idea of, of potentially how it might be used in a case. The aim is that they will essentially give it to somebody else. They will figure out the mechanics of putting it into a, into a courtroom, whichever courtroom then presents, it, presents itself. Um, with UNITAD, it's a little bit different. Uh, UNITAD is mandated specifically to build cases of uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, um, primarily in the courts of Iraq, but of course the Iraqi courts currently um, don't have legislation that would allow those crimes to be indicted aside from the, the not irrelevant issue of use of the death penalty. And so what we're seeing now is the path towards uh, justice or the sparks of accountability are really occurring predominantly in courts in, in Europe, um, in, in, um, in uh, courts usually with the civil law system such as uh, Germany primarily. For UNITAD, there is a very close eye on ensuring that the evidence is being gathered and um, its probative value being retained um, in such a way that allows it to be used directly in court evidence. So there is still a space because UNITAD obviously will not ultimately be in charge of the prosecutorial strategy and that has to be an aspect, but nevertheless, um, the create collection of evidence is as such that you have, um, you build it in a way that you would in any uh, prosecution case um, with an eye to identifying what will need to be disclosed, usually with quite a wide understanding of what could be disclosed because we're working without an understanding of which rules of procedure and evidence will be governed by. Um, making sure that if we're engaging people who can be used as expert witnesses, that all the terms of assignment will also pass muster under the most rigorous system, and also ensuring that the probative value through chain of custody, through documentation, handling, storage of all the information and evidence that's being collected will also pass muster with quite a wide range of, of justice systems. We do work to international standards, UNITAD works to international standards, but uh, it is, it is, I have to say, still a challenge to collect evidence, to build a case for a case that does not exist in a court in a jurisdiction of which we are still unaware. So there are, 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 there are certainly tripwires, yes. Yeah, so um, you mentioned there, say, Germany. Uh, uh, so there must be a, a suspect or, or someone within that, that jurisdiction against whom a, course, court, uh, a case is going to be, be brought. 
Um, but I guess you've got such a wide range of materials from um, a complete across the ground coverage to collect information from, from victims. How are you able to focus it upon a particular prosecution? Because we're, we're prosecuting individuals. Crime base is, I can, I can see that that can be developed quite easy in your, your suite, but then getting it in relation to individuals, how, how do you target that? So a lot of it will originate either from crime base or from documentary information. As I said uh, in my remarks, like having insider witnesses, having defectors from ISIS, very challenging um, to, get the, to get that kind of insight uh, into the armed group itself. The investigations are done with the, with the aim of identifying individuals. Because the, the mandate of UNITAD is towards um, identifying cases to go up for courts, then it really relies upon very early on identifying people who are involved in the crimes necessarily. And as anyone who works in the tribunals on cases will know that tends to be the people who are at the lowest level who are physically closest to the scenes of the crimes or to the crimes taking place and then building upwards from there. So there are people of interest that are scattered actually all over the world. Um, the question of when it directs to a specific country often originates from that country itself. Of course, if we're aware of someone who's in the territory of a country, then um, there might be a proactive outreach, but often it is the reverse where the countries sending in requests for information about people who are in their jurisdiction, people who they are looking at as potential suspects. And so it becomes almost, a, a UNITAD becomes a meeting point in the middle for the collection of information, the drawing in of information and distilling it from NGOs, CSOs, and the receiving of requests for, inf for information, requests for assistance from state authorities who don't have the capacity within their systems to do that larger structural investigation of what happened on the ground in Iraq. The big question is, how do you ensure that they marry? How do you ensure that the person's on the territory is the person that information is collected towards? And the answer to that is there is there is no way to in, ensure of that. The aim is to, to bolster the case as much as possible. And there will be occasions largely for people who have put themselves into the public view, who have been on ISIL videos, for example, who have been very public in, in terms of the material they've kept on their mobile phone devices or uh, or in on their laptops that they've been arrested or detained with in Germany or other countries. That will allow that mix to take place. But there's a certain element of, um, of serendipity, if one can use that word, uh, in respect of, of ISIL crimes, of course, to um, that meeting of uh, the jurisdiction, the accused being capable of being retained and the evidence of the crime and the linkage being collected from the ground. So Alex, um, intermediaries, if you're, do, do you target an intermediary, use an intermediary to target an individual and collect the evidence? Or do you use an intermediary to provide whatever they know? How, how do you deploy intermediaries? Because I can see dangers if you start targeting it. You, 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 you get the Labanga type problem. I, I, I don't know what exactly happened in that case, but I guess that would have been one of the problems that, that caused the issues. How do, what is the best way to deal with it? Well, I think that I think that the problem that you're you're uh, touching on is is actually a larger problem in, in or challenge in investigations, which is and it and it's something that I think that um, Jillian alluded to and 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 Sarita touched on as well, which is how how do you how do you focus your investigation and how do you how do you strike the balance between focus on the one hand and broad, and broad on the other. You want it focused because you can't, you can't investigate an entire situation and you have, to, you have to be efficient and you have to try to zero in on potential targets or potential crimes that you might wanna prosecute. You can't just investigate forever. On the other hand, you have, to, it, it, you have to be broad enough so that you're getting the truth and you're getting a full picture and you're not falling into what Jillian referred to as confirmation bias. Um, and and that, that's a general challenge in investigations and it's a particular one with respect to intermediaries. And you have to be mindful in using intermediaries of, 
of that challenge. You, you cannot, the thing you cannot do is set is task intermediaries to get a certain kind of evidence. Um, what, what you can do is task them to contact a, 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 a victim community um, uh, in order to uh, establish communications with that community and be able to bring witnesses out of that community so that they can be interviewed safely um, and with integrity in some other location. Um, so in intermediaries are, are a process tool to overcome challenges in, in, in the investigation, um, but they shouldn't shape the substance of the investigation. And that's the measures that I, I tried to uh, indicate are, are ways of making sure that they don't, they don't direct the investigation, they don't taint it, they don't shape it. They merely make it possible to uh, locate witnesses and interview them. Yes, I mean, the kind of training uh, that, that would be given to an intermediary, uh, that would be quite useful to know. When, when we've done cases, I've always insisted there's been what we call a protocol or a direction document that says what they can do and what they can't do. And they drive us from the airport to point A where we're going to meet somebody for an interview and then move us to a place where we may want to photograph, et cetera, et cetera. But it's my case, I'm, I'm driving it. Um, what do you do as a prosecutor? How, how, how do you man manage them? So I, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because I, I think intermediaries is not just a prosecution tool. It's used by, it's used by the defense. Um, it's used by the victim representatives. They also use intermediaries to identify victims and, and, and talk to them. Um, I, think there, I think there are two things you do and you, and you actually touched on them. One is, um, one is training. So you have to spend some time with the intermediary and explain what the process is, what, the, what, the, what their job is, what the risks are, and instill in them um, so, uh, an understanding of what the roles are and what the, and what the objective is of the investigation. And of course, if in that process, you sense that the person, that the intermediary, the proposed intermediary is not, uh, is not um, uh, on board with that uh, program, then, then you shouldn't use that person. And then the second thing is you have, as you say, you, have, you, you should have a, a, a protocol. You should, you, in, in many cases, you actually script it. You script for the uh, intermediary what they're going to say. You say, okay, I, I'd like you to go into this community um, and speak with these individuals. And this is what I want you to say. And this is all that I want you to say. Um, and then that is how you make an, a, a contact with the witness. And then when you speak with the witness, you confirm that, um, that that's all that was said. Um, I, I should say that in this, in this respect, there's nothing extraordinary about intermediaries as an investigative tool. All investigative tools, um, whether it's talking to witnesses, whether it's collecting documents, um, you have to uh, constantly be checking to make sure that you're, you're, you're that there's no bias, that there's no um, taint of the evidence, um, that you're uh, preserving it carefully, that you're following protocols. So in this regard, intermediaries are a tool like many other investigative tools. It's an important tool, but it has to be done carefully um, and properly um, and, and in a way that is regulated to ensure the integrity of the process. Yeah, Jill, just turning to you, now um, on substantiating the evidence, um, Alex has raised the issues, um, taint investigation and it no longer um, be an independent one. What, what, the, what are the signs, what do you look for in relation to whether an investigation has been tainted? How, how do you know? I think the points that Alex raises, it sort of makes me think of a very um, nuanced dance um, that has to be danced between the prosecutor and the intermediaries, because there is a risk that um, your intermediaries will develop some sort of power 
or some sort of autonomy if they're not, as Alex suggests, properly trained, vetted, uh, have a strong hand on. So they are something that needs to be controlled. Uh, and I think in terms of how you detect whether an intermediary has started to play perhaps a different role than the one is in, that the one that is intended is when you go through as defense and you are sifting and you are looking and examining each piece of evidence in turn, not only just for the sources, the nature, but also we're questioning how did this evidence come into play? How did it get here? Who's bringing it? What else are they bringing? Is what they're bringing legitimate or does it smack of the building of a predetermined case. So from a defense perspective, I've got a very critical eye on not only its source and provenance, but how much of it is perhaps coming from one individual or another. So looking at the percentage uh, as I dissect each piece. And I wonder if I could throw something back as well to Alex, and I also noticed that Ted Meron has a question that he may want to unmute afterwards to, to ask, and I invite you to do so. But one question, if I may, Alex, that, that I'd like to, to ask you is, do you ever have problems or challenges given the size and number of prosecutors often in, say, let's take an ICC case, for example, do you foresee challenges given the number of people on board in a team that are having to review evidence, make sure that things go according to plan. I suppose my question is, are there potential management problems, not only for your intermediaries, but also for your ongoing disclosure obligations? Because of course, often your prosecution teams are much larger than the defense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, I, I've managed teams at the at, at the at the Yugoslavia Tribunal at the International Criminal Court. I'm now the deputy prosecutor here, managing managing the office, and you know, managing a team is is um, is it's always challenging to make sure that the that the prosecutors investigators are following procedures. And um, I, I think that these offices, in my experience, tend to be quite um, tightly managed from the top. Um, and so I, in my position right now, I'm very, um, very much in the weeds and I've, and I've always been, uh, been so, um, I will say that I'm a little, uh, it, I'm, it's not often that the question is, how do you manage such a big prosecution team? Because actually the problem, the problem that we face is that we have such tiny, prosecution teams, given the scale of the investigations and the scales of the crimes. But, um, but the, whether it's big or small, relatively, um, the, the challenges you, you point out are, are ones that we have to take seriously and, and always think about and improve. Um, one thing, if I, can, if I can jump on something that you said before, I don't know if um, Ted Marone will then pose a question, is um, I agreed very much with your remarks at the beginning about, about um, confirmation bias and about certain categories of evidence that we should be particularly careful about, NGO reports in criminal investigations, for example. But I think where I might depart from, from a, I think the, a, a bit of the tone of your remarks is that um, I don't, when you were talking about sifting evidence, I do think that you have to constantly as a prosecutor, and I think probably also as a defense, but obviously the burden is on the prosecution, you have to evaluate evidence. Um, but, the, but I don't wanna leave an impression in, and perhaps you weren't trying to leave this impression that, that there's good evidence and there's bad evidence. And you, 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 in your investigation, you, you, you select out the good building blocks and you throw away the bad evidence. In my experience, evidence does, isn't usually like that. Um, it's usually almost all the evidence is mixed. Um, and there, there, there are, there are, it's good in some respects, bad in some respects. And the, and the challenge for the prosecution, for the defense, for the judges making the final decision is evaluating the evidence and the weight of the evidence and how it's corroborated and how it all fits together. My experience is that almost no evidence is perfect. There's always some bias. There's always some blind spot. There's always some weakness. There's always something. And so all evidence is 
most the evidence that you get is compromised in some way. And the question is not each individual piece of evidence and its worth, but how it all fits together. Yeah. Sarita. Yes, I, I, and I would agree with that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If I can just turn to Sarita, because you're on the ground in, in Alex's opening remarks, he mentioned about the difficulties in cases where he's been where they're forced to use an intermediary because um, they don't have a real presence in the location and the prosecution is often thousands of miles away. Uh, is, is, has there been a difference in relation to how you have approached it in relation to your work at UNITEP? Yes, I mean, the, the singular, as someone who's worked on both Syria and Iraq, there is a singular advantage to being entrenched on the ground. Um, there's the obvious advantage of, ha of having, uh, having the contact with survivor communities, of building those relationships, um, of being able to directly access sources of information, diverse sources of information. It's also very helpful, to be honest, for the investigative team and investigators themselves to better understand the, the social framework and the social grammar of the society, the framework under which uh, crimes took place, how um, grievances in the community and prejudices against certain groups morphed into intense underlying crimes um, and so on. Um, so there hasn't been that need necessarily for this, uh, this um, segue, this, uh, this um, holding position between the investigators and the survivor communities. It's also meant we can potentially have more direct contact with those who may be detained, those who are from, for example, the Sunni community who are not aligned with ISIS, but who also want to speak about what they know about command structures and so on. So there's a it's been actually a, a tremendous boon to the, to the investigation um, and to both in terms of ensuring that the, the colors by which we are under painting the narrative, the understanding of people who often um, are from countries and cultures very different from that of, of, of Northern Iraq, are uh, really understanding how to put and frame, frame the case and to involve the survivor communities to the extent that it is, is appropriate. Yeah, Alex, if I can just turn, turn back to you. Um, I, I've always been surprised sometimes, um, well, I have been surprised, um, that there hasn't been a, a big office in, let's say, Nairobi in the Kenya investigations or else, elsewhere. I had, if I was setting it up, I would have a presence. I would have a building. I, 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 I would have something that meant that I was in control and I would be able to direct people and I'd know what was going on on the ground and you would have a, a, a properly arranged setup so that you could do it just like you were a police force um, in a national investigation. I know you have experience of that in, before you came into the international uh, legal world. Why, why doesn't that happen? Well, I can tell you there's been discussion about doing that, about, uh, about having a, a stronger field presence. And um, it, 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 uh, at the International Criminal Court, um, I, and I think that's what you're talking about, because most of the ad hoc tribunals do, in fact, set up a, field, a strong field presence. Um, it's, it, it, it is, there, there are kind of two problems. The first is that it is enormously complicated um, logistically, um, financially and so forth. And, and the, 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 you know, the, the ICC is operating now, it's in, it has investigations in 10 different countries. So if you start to set up field offices, um, first of all, it takes, a, it takes a long time to do that. You, you know, you, you, that, that can take a year or two to get, a, to get a, a, a building, get it set up, get people, staff there, um, hire people for that. Um, so uh, there are there are resource limitations and there are logistical limitations to, to being able to do that. The second thing is um, there, there are real questions about what it would do because yes, you would have a building and yes, you would have a presence. And I think that, the, and, and this sort of goes to Sarita's point about being on the ground. And if you're on the ground a lot, you, you, you gain from that. But you, but you will not, by having a building, of course, 
be a police force. You don't have any of the powers of the police. You don't have any of the authority. And so you, you will face still many of the um, investigative limitations and challenges that you face from, from uh, the fact that you're an international institution. So um, I, I think there, there, there could be a lot to be gained from it. And, I, and, and um, maybe it is something that should be further explored in the future. But it's but I can it's challenging. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I can under understand that. Um, it's a challenge that gets away in in it gets away uh, uh, in the way of the best way of doing the job. I think uh, that I think that's what you, what what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I some um, questions. There's one I'm looking at um, here. Um, which has come in from Trinethra. And do you think the fruit of the poison tree doctrine in theory and or practice requires revision and why? So a big one for the panel, Ill unlawfully obtained evidence or illegally obtained evidence. Um, should that be admissible in international trials? Um, should international trials be different from national trials? Should you do away with human rights in international trials? Uh, which could be the, the, the extension of that question. I, I'd like to hear your views. Saritha, let, let's start with you. Fruit of the poison tree, should they? And you're a human rights lawyer as well, so we're all watching you. <laughs> no pressure. Um, I would have to say, in terms of uh, illegally obtained evidence, uh, evidence obtained, for example, under torture, um, no, I don't think it should be, I don't think the rule should be revised to allow that uh, admissibility to evidence. There's always, I think, when particularly perhaps when dealing with mass atrocity crimes, always the temptation to try and pull in as much as possible for as many sources as possible. I think here, um, and here speaking specifically about being part of an investigation that is taking place in Iraq where uh, the, the, um, the information will be used all over the world. One of the things we're also doing is trying to uh, uh, adhere to best international practices, but promulgate that practices, model those practices inside countries where there may be significant issues around, for example, torture and interrogation, which has been uh, documented by Human Rights Watch. So I don't think the answer is to secure convictions by opening up the rules, which then um, create a massive room for either increased human rights violations or violations at the point of, of collection of evidence, especially with national authorities, or else um, entrenching impunity for violations that already exist. So for me, I think it is, it is harder because it does make potentially the job of those building the cases um, a little bit more challenging, but I think that building cases for mass atrocities, it, it should be challenging. It should be about getting the best possible available evidence and, and modeling how to create a case to, to jurisdictions where mass atrocities are preventing, which mass atrocities are occurring, sorry, but which do, don't necessarily have as many safeguards in either their law or the implementation of, 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 of how they're collecting information and evidence. Yeah, so Alex, turning to you, let's drop it below torture though, but to <laughs> something like um, an inducement. We won't prosecute you if you tell us about this person, um, which in many jurisdictions would, would rule a, 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 an interview and evidence from it as inadmissible, um, or hacking, let's say hacking unlawfully obtained evidence. What, what, what do you think? Do you think uh, international prosecutors like you should be able to, to have that type of evidence? So the, I, I, those are great questions. And I, I think that, so we have a set of rules for our court uh, and every court I've worked at, we, we have a set of rules for what we can do and what we can't do in collecting evidence. And certainly if we break those rules then the one possible consequence can be that the evidence is suppressed or its weight is, is dismissed or something. Where, where the challenge arises, I think, um, is when uh, other people um, in, in the you know, national jurisdiction, they break rules in their own jurisdiction 
which may not be the rules that apply to us because they're a national jurisdiction. Um, and then they provide the evidence to us. And there, that becomes much more complicated, right? Um, because um, hacking, for example, uh, if somebody, somebody, an insider steals confidential information, which is critical to a case and provides it to us, should we be able to use it? Um, I, typically the answer is yes, that the tribunals can use evidence that is obtained by other people um, uh, who may be breaking rules in collecting it. Um, uh, as long as it doesn't as long as it doesn't undermine the integrity of the proceedings. So torture evidence, for example, you, even that obviously undermines the integrity of the proceedings. Um, inducements, um, that, that is not something that is prohibited by our, our rules. The key there is that you have to be transparent. Uh, if a witness has been promised something, um, that has to be disclosed to the defense, that has to be disclosed to the judge and the judge um, the fact finder can weigh that in evaluating the evidence, whether, the, whether to disregard the evidence or whether to continue to give it weight. Um, the, 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 this court or the international courts cannot be bound by all of the rules of all the national jurisdictions. Um, it, has, it is bound by its own rules and by a principle of integrity. Um, but oftentimes evidence that is valuable to discovering the truth may have been uh, obtained um, by, by theft, for example, or some other means. Um, and as long as it doesn't undermine the integrity, it's something that I think that prosecutors should have and the court, the fact finder should have available to them. Jill, if there's a breach of the national laws of a jurisdiction by a prosecutor or someone, and then that goes into the international system. Can the international courts have a different standard? Is, is that a good thing or a, a bad thing? Should, should that be allowed? What, what's your position? Well, I, th I, I think for me, I go back to the touchstones that both Sarita and Alex have mentioned. So we're looking at of an international court to uphold, we expect the upholding of integrity, authenticity, reliability, credibility, accuracy. These are all the touchstones and the high level of operation we expect the court to act according to. And I think some of Alex's examples are really interesting because I can foresee a situation such as the one Alex has described um, where there has been a breach of national procedure, that the matter at an international level, it may go to wait. But the really important thing there, which again, Alex has touched on, is transparency, is that the arguments are able to be made, if that is the case, if there is to be an argument about its admissibility, that the defence are in a position to be able to, of course, make the argument. So the transparency of where the information has come from, the openness about the breach of the national procedure, the severity of the breach, all of those things come into play. And from the defence perspective, Stephen, I'm thinking of occasions in national trials, which I know you've had and so have, so have I, where you might receive information, for example, we call it sort of the brown envelope incident, where suddenly your past information, obviously very difficult, different from the prosecutor's perspective, but you have this information and then the challenge is, again, where does it come from? How good is it? Is it a mixed bag as Alex talks about? Do we have an argument as, as to its admissibility? So as long as we have those touchstones very much at the front of the mind and we have that transparency, then I can see that there are instances where at an international level, the question becomes one of weight. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, all our listeners can, are invited to send any questions that they want on the special chat line that we have here. You're all muted by central command, so I can't unmute you. And uh, probably not a good idea that I handled any controls anyway. So you operate the chat button and I'll pick out what I can. But Trinitra raised another issue, and I, I think this is a broad ethical one that... that um, um, we should raise here. 
Um, if a state doesn't cooperate with the ICC, um, should there be a lesser standard of justice applied to a case? I mean, the question is, given some of the new situations that the ICC is authorized to invest, investigate and the non-cooperation thereof, how much could history repeat itself in terms of probative value and how can these misgivings be avoided? I'd like to phrase it this way. If the state isn't cooperating, do, does it entitle the uh, prosecutor at the ICC or any other tribunal, um, it mustn't put it all in the direction of the ICC, um, should it entitle them to apply a lesser standard of justice? We, we had issues like this in the Kenya case. Feelings about that. I'll, I'll turn to to um, Alex first. Uh, yeah, I would say no. The answer is no. Um, the 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 court is uh, prosecuting individuals, and they are uh, uh, no matter what is going on with the state, even if they're a member of the state, even if they're influential in the state. Um, the if the state is not cooperating, that doesn't diminish the rights of the individual. In a, in a criminal prosecution. Um, the answer there, the, the, the answer for the prosecution, it, there are two potential answers. Are, one is um, to try to find ways to get, to gain cooperation or to gain the evidence despite the cooperation, the lack of cooperation. Um, and the second is if the lack of cooperation uh, tips over into criminal acts of obstruction, uh, then those should also be addressed by the by the prosecution with appropriate measures. Yeah, um, Sarita, Bill Shabbos has come in with a with a question here, which which I'll direct to you. Are the new investigation mechanisms obliged to investigate exculpatory evidence, and if so, are you confident that they are doing this? So that's yeah. quite a big issue in the sort of context that you're working in, Sarita. It, it's a it's a, a very good question. Um, there's there's no uh, while there's nothing explicitly stating that the groups collect exculpatory evidence. It's very clear that we collect in accordance with international best practices. That includes um, in collecting information which is both inculpatory and exculpatory. Um, often inf information which is inculpatory of, of one particular individual may well be exculpatory of another if we're speaking about one particular crime scene. Um, and so the view that has been taken um, has been that, uh, that yes, we collect both in inculpatory and exculpatory information, that both of it has to be uh, disclosed to uh, prosecutors who are working on the cases. Um, of course, the prosecutors will then within their national system abide by their own disclosure uh, obligations about disclosing it outwards, including to the defense. Um, am I confident that this is, this is happening? Um, yes, I am confident that this is happening, however, uh, speaking as someone who comes from a, a, a more of a defense background, I think there does need to be continued um, reinforcing of the message that, you know, building cases for fair trials does include um, including uh, uh, dossiers which include inculpatory and exculpatory inf information. I think some of the challenges, and I don't think this is really limited to simply the new investigative mechanisms, but is broadly across kind of prosecutorial culture altogether, is to keep the focus on um, fair trials uh, rather than achieving convictions. Um, I think that where we run into this idea of, for example, in, in the case of, uh, of UNITAD, or in Iraq generally, of ISIL being responsible, the responsibility kind of being positioned with the group and whichever individual is accused then essentially being um, representative of ISIL and all, all of its crimes, then you have the um, potential of a breakdown when it comes to recording exculpatory information, ensuring that that information is properly recorded, stored, and then uh, conveyed to authorities. But I think that's not uh, something that is is uh, significant, is particular to the new investigative mechanism. So um, I, I do think that there needs to be more conversations about exculpatory evidence as, as the investigation deepens, um, to keep that at the forefront of people's minds, that it's, it's not a, a conviction-oriented investigation as no investigation should be. But to date, yes, it's very much been an aspect of the information collection and uh, storage and uh, transfer exercise. 
Do, do you have any prosecutor from any jurisdiction or in any way directing you in your, your team's work, uh, Sarita, or... Um, no, to, yeah, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah, to, to the extent that I can, I'm obviously not going into individual cases, but oh, yes. Yeah. So direct is probably not the right verb, yeah. but uh, but generally what happens is we have two planks of uh, prosecutorial interactions. Uh, uh, the first is uh, simply looking for information about a particular crime scene or usually a particular name perpetrator. Um, and that tends to be uh, just a simple transfer of information. There may also be prosecutors who are, for example, doing investigations on the ground, where we have access to interviewees that they don't have. And then you may have the specter potentially of either of them providing information that they want included in the interview plans for particular interviewees or uh, the potential facilitating a remote interview with them. I would hope that in future, as the investigation deepens, we have the third rail of essentially the transfer of information, the pro of proactively identifying people who are in different countries and then alerting authorities to the potential of a case in that, in that country. Yeah. Jill, the um, next question I'm going to ask is from Craig uh, Eggett about gaps in the rules on evidence before international courts. What approach do practitioners take to try and fill those gaps and argue what the correct legal provision should be to cover something? Because if you remember, um, there are very few uh, rules of, of evidence, particularly at the start in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and uh, a very narrow uh, um, scoping was given in the statute for the tribunal and the judges developed rules on evidence and procedure um, mm. and did that with the consultation of the prosecutor at the ICTY, um, whoever at that particular time, time it was. Um, but there have been issues of points of law not covered by the rules. I remember taking one in relation to ID procedures in the Tardic case and uh, no one um, uh, approached me quite the same way as I was approaching it on how to conduct an ID parade. So, so what do practitioners do? And perhaps, because you've worked on several cases, can you describe um, how uh, lawyers approach you? Yes, um, and I think thinking back as well, Stephen, to Milosevic, it's very much like the development of the substantive law. So where there are gaps there, one of the first things that we would do, often laboriously in the early days, would be to try and draw and pull from different national jurisdictions um, how they approached a particular issue, whether it be a mode of liability, or similarly, whether it be an evidential issue, which is what the question raises here. And of course, we then have that complexity of blending the common law and civil law systems in terms of the ICC and the hybrid tribunals. And so again, the discussion becomes quite nuanced. It's, it's a real challenge for common law lawyers to step outside of their common law practice and their upbringing and to actually think how should this work in the system in which I find myself? Almost let me uproot myself and think if I can split my brain in two to think civil common, how might that meld work given what this court is designed to do? And so to take in that whole perspective of the international crime. So I think we go back to those comparative studies, whether it be substantive or evidential development of the law. And I think clarity is the key, isn't it? So again, we're trying to argue perhaps creatively for what we would prefer the rules to be up against the other side, creatively <laughs> arguing. And so actually, legally, it becomes a very creative space. And that's really exciting for lawyers. And we've had a lot of um, moments, I think, where we have really sat there and thought, there isn't, there isn't a one answer here. Uh, and so this is interesting and exciting and maybe we're on the cusp of something. And so the law develops through that argument process and the drawing upon those national jurisdictions. And I think if I may just say this, um, in terms of the collection of evidence, 
we are also facing not only gaps, but challenges as to how the rules should be developed to assist the people that Sarita is referring to, those first responders, as well as Alex's professional investigators, as to not only what rules apply in whichever court it may appear, but what rules apply on the ground? How can we assist, develop, and also publicize? Because it's all very well giving an app to somebody and telling them to go and record the evidence. But we need to, and we have a responsibility to continue to develop as well, the process of not only recording, but how we do that to engage with that future court process. So again, lots of creative thinking, I think is needed there and publicizing of clear standards, whatever those standards may be. Yeah, I've always said you leave your archbold in my case, you, you approach the world completely differently when you enter The Hague. And if I, I just may be permitted a short war story in the Tardich trial um, called Disco Tardich and Alan Teager for the prosecution got up and said, right, uh, we want full disclosure from the defense of everything that's communicated between the uh, defense and their client. Um, and uh, he was trying an, an evidential rule that was um, a development, if I could put it like that, um, of an American rule. And um, we were faced immediately with a crisis. Uh, how did we deal with it? Actually, we got all our... Uh, cards out that we knew of lawyers around the world. I think there were about 45 um, in different jurisdictions, Ori, Vladimirov and myself, and we sent faxes out immediately to their officers saying, how do you deal with uh, professional privilege in criminal cases? And we got the assembled reports together. We made a filing on the right of the defense to have legal uh, a, a professional privilege in relation to it to its work and after a day's argument in court and these were all novel points we ruled in, in my view but we had a, a a lawyer from the former east germany we even had and i can tell you that there is professional privilege in china because that there was a response from from there so we we mined whatever seems we could for what was a, a rather nasty little surprise that I had to deal with uh, at, at the start of Mr. Tardich's evidence, but we, we moved on and the case developed. Um, Alex, as a prosecutor, is your framework, your um, American jurisdiction, your European knowledge, or do you draw from all the sources uh, that, that there are available to you? Well, here I agree completely with Jillian um, that the that the what makes this work um, interesting, challenging, fun, um, e e exciting, uh, even while it is, of course, um, serious and sobering and and hard, is that we um, that it's creative. Uh, and I I um, my experience in this world is that people tend to come to the world with their armed with their system and uh, the, the, how their system works. And they, they, they're very good at deploying those argu arguments about why that system makes sense. Um, but, but what I have found is that people quickly uh, learn to appreciate other ways of doing things. Um, and, and I think that, that um, it is essential for this world that it is be, that it is able to draw on a number of different traditions both for its legitimacy as a inter, as a body of international law that will function globally but also so that it will be successful because um i i think what is critical oh my we've just lost our lights here um what's critical um it, i think it's you know i don't know what's going on here but um i'll be all right but what's critical is that is that international criminal law in these cases and the tribunals present particular challenges. Um, and we have to devise evidentiary procedures and solutions and processes that address those challenges 
while recognizing the risks that also arise from these proceedings. And in devising those solutions, um, you have to be able to draw, you have to have flexibility and you have to be able to draw on a number of different traditions. Um, so I, I, I have learned from um, other traditions, I've appreciated them. And what I think is um, the, su the, the, the success of this project will be if it can continue to draw on the knowledge and practice of many different countries. Thank you. Now we're in the last uh, five minutes before we have to, and the lights go out. They've already gone out, Brad, as as we can. Ah, there we go. Oh. Going back on. You <laughs> just had to move. Uh, back on. Uh, but we're in the last five minutes. I'm just going to look at Muhammad Badar's question in a slightly uh, different way. Um, when investigating a situation under a, a mandate, um, do prosecutors, should prosecutors, should whoever is, is there in the field um, investigate both sides rather than one side? You might have a specific mandate to investigate uh, one particular uh, party or one particular type of force or militia or, or uh, whatever. And should it be that you collect evidence that, that reveal what everybody did? Should there be an openness about these investigations? Sarita, what, 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 what's your position on that? Um, to some extent, I think it depends on where the mandate comes from and what the mandate says. So, you know, a, a, someone working for an international criminal tribunal is going to have a very different kind of originating mandate from a group which is set up like UNITAD um, in the Security Council with the consent of the government with Iraq, which is the only thing which allows UNITAD to continue to work um, in Iraq. Um, so, you know, I, I've taken note of the question. It's not, it is, it is a, the mandate is very clear coming out of the Security Council. And it's also very much a, a condition of working in Iraq. So yes, the mandate is to look at um, crimes committed by ISIL. Just in relation to just UNITAD specifically before I broaden out, um, that one of the aims in, in doing this work in, in creating increasing capacity within the Iraqi system, in working with the Iraqi system to change the law so that you can have war crimes, crimes against humanity and uh, genocide incorporated into domestic law is to allow for potentially the future cases against other entities to be brought by the Iraqi system to model that kind of rule of law into the system. But in general, where there is that flexibility then, uh, and where's that flexibility where it doesn't, uh, you know, affect the ability to actually do any of the mandate, then certainly, you know, I, I would, it would be, uh, it would be good to construe a mandate if it's possible um, to encompass, uh, you know, a number of different perpetrators as in fact occurs when the situations are referred uh, to the ICC. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the example that's always used is Rwanda, where we've, we've got two sides and one side uh, not prosecuted, but there's been a lot of evidence um, a, a, about what happened with the RPF. So, Alex, what, what, what do you think about it? And without putting you in a professional position, because you are a prosecutor and you, you've got a... Um, standard, but 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 just talking from your own perspective rather than in a, a, an official perspective, this has caused a lot of disquiet. It still comes up twenty years later in, in conversations and in articles when when you read them. Yeah, it, it's an issue that arose at the ICTY, at the Rwanda Tribunal, at the at the International Criminal Court. Um, I, I as, as Sarita said, sometimes your mandate limits your ability to. Uh, investigate and prosecute both sides. But when you can, of course you should, but the reality is you, you, sometimes you can't. Uh, and these one feature of these tribunals, and it goes to the heart of many of the things that we've been talking about in terms of collect, doing investigations and collecting evidence is that they are relatively weak or, or institutions. We don't have police forces. We don't have independent authority, we're very, we're very contingent, we're very dependent on circumstances um, and on cooperation. And while, while these are not political institutions in the sense that they, uh, in my experience, that they are trying to achieve political objectives or politically driven, 
they are subject to politics around us and, and constrained by the politics around us. And sometimes, sometimes the circumstances on the ground do not permit an investigation simultaneously of both sides. And so sometimes you have to investigate one side and then later investigate the other side. So the ideal, um, and we're always striving for the ideal, but the ideal is to investigate both sides. The reality is that, and, and we have to live in reality, is that it's not always possible. I remember, Jill, at the Rwanda tribunal, um, uh, there, there was some order by the court. I can't, it may have been conditional release of a, uh, an accused, I think it was that, and immediately Rwanda withdrew its cooperation to the tribunal. And uh, if you were defense counsel at that time, you start to become worried because uh, it looked like there was an external influence by a government on, on the, that, that court. What, can you remember that incident yes. in better detail? I, I do remember it in some detail. So the individual was Barry Aguiza. Um, and I think it was an abusive process argument and he was um, released or the, the decision was to release him or to, to give him some form of release within moments, um, the government of Rwanda. It, for me watching it, it was very clear that there was an external influence and before very long, uh, not only was he not released, but there was a reversal of the decision. And you would have to go back to look in better detail than I can give you now about that. But as I say, as an external watching it, there was completely clear interference by the state. Um, so I think these instances, again, in an ideal world wouldn't happen, but in Alex's real world, they, they need special attention, special regard. And what we're looking for in terms of prosecutors is we're just looking for a fair fight with a three-dimensional prosecutor with an open, fair mind who has an eye, of course, on the exculpatory evidence. And I think we all recognize you there, Alex, okay, from that. <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, just after quarter past six now in the UK. I know people have tuned in from the US and Sweden and oh, many. I can see all the names and I know you're from a variety of, of, of jurisdictions. It, it's great to see you. We hope you've enjoyed um, the evening as part of our webinar series. And it's been great to host you. And I thank you from Nine Bedford Road for uh, tuning in.